Tonight, we're very excited to have with us Terry Brooks, author of the New York Times best-selling Shannara novels, with his latest book, The Black Elfstone, the first book of his epic four-part conclusion to the series. Terry Brooks has thrilled readers for decades with his powers of imagination and storytelling. He's the author of more than 30 books, many of which are New York Times bestsellers and lives with his wife, Judine, in the Pacific Northwest. And now, please join me in welcoming Terry Brooks. So, uh, show of hands, how many have read this book? <laughs> how far, are, how many are past chapter one? Humor. So I'm going to read to you, because I'm in the mood to read to somebody. And you are here, a captive audience. Tigeron, the leader of Orsa's Guild and one of the most feared assassins in all of our fleet, sat alone at a table at the back of the Bullfinch Tavern, waiting. Smoke from pipes clamped between teeth and oil lamps set upon tables clouded the air with a pungent haze, wafting to the rafters along the walls. Smokeless lamps were dis... Woo. Smokeless... <laughs> okay. Smokeless, smokeless lamps were discouraged in places like this where so many of the customers preferred an anonymity. It was crowded enough that such anonymity would have been impossible otherwise, and Tigeron did not necessarily disagree with the reasoning of his fellow patrons. The noise was ferocious, shouts and laughter and conversations fighting to reach the ears of those seated just across the table from each other. Pitchers filled with glasses, pitchers filled glasses which rose to meet eager mouths which gulped and swallowed until the ale was gone and the glasses refilled to begin the process anew. Much of the amber liquid was spilled on the wooden boards of the worn tavern floor and more than a little stained the clothes of the customers. Manners were not anywhere near as popular as raucous behavior. Tigeron hunched over his glass, watching everything around him without seeming to do so. Watching, but mostly waiting. He was a big man, burly and muscular, his head heavy on his shoulders, his face rough-featured and scarred, his hair cut short and close to his scalp, his broken nose prominent, and his eyes hard and empty. He wore a heavy cloak with the hood pulled back and the drawstrings unfastened. It was warm in the cavernous drinking room, but he ignored it. The cloak served a more useful purpose than providing warmth. Beneath it were seven blades, all hidden in various sheaths within his clothing, all readily within reach, any one of them so sharp it could cut through bone. He never went anywhere without them. His eyes shifted to the tavern's front doors. A client was coming, but had not yet arrived. It was unusual for Tigeron to meet with a client under such circumstances. Normally, such meetings took place in the cellars of his fortress lair, Revelations, where he was surrounded by protections and protectors and in complete control of any situation. But this client had been insistent the meeting was to take place in a public house, a demand Tigeron would have normally dismissed out of hand, but a rather large number of credits placed in the hands of those who vetted such requests, some of which were passed on to him, persuaded him of the other's seriousness and proved an inducement too persuasive to ignore. No advantage to either party, the client had insisted. No danger that one or the other might act inappropriately, which clearly meant Tigeron, since the client would have had no advantage at all in revelations. Yet the promise of further credits in such large amounts was intriguing. What harm could it do to hear the client out? His enemies would never invite Tigeron to a tavern to do him in, they would be subtler in their efforts. Besides, he was too cautious not to guard against such attempts. After all, he was in the business of bringing harm to others rather than to himself. He glanced over to the men sitting at a table nearby, three hardened, experienced killers who worked for him and would come to his aid in an instant if he was threatened, not to mention that he was his own best weapon. Others had tried to kill him in the past. He had buried them all. Outside, the wind was howling. The shutters closed and latch rattled against their casings with its force. Tigeron had seen the storm approaching on his way to this meeting. 
huge black clouds rolling in from the west, filled with lightning and thunder, a dark promise of the deluge yet to come. But he made no move to leave, even though the client was late. He simply waited. He was good at waiting. It was very much a requirement in his work. Still, he could see that his associates were growing restless, their bodies shifting in their chairs, their gazes turned away from one another, their conversations exhausted. It was not his problem. They would wait as they had been instructed to wait. A black cloaked figure appeared through the doors, pausing at the entrance and looking around the room. Droplets of rain dotted his cloak, and his head and face were hidden in the deep shadows of a hood. This had to be the client. Tigeron stood to signal and waited as the stranger crossed to his table. Tigeron, the stranger asked. A man from his voice and now his face as well as features coming into the light as the gleam of the oil lamp burning on the table etched them out of the hood's darkness. He was smooth faced with a serene look on his countenance. His skin was unusually pale and his hair quite blonde. His features were calm and expressionless as if carved from stone. Hagaron nodded and gestured to the seat across from him then sat himself. The stranger slid into place smoothly and silently, his eyes on Tigeron all the while. Nasty weather coming, he said, his voice soft. Tigeron nodded again. What services do you require of Osiris? He growled, eager to get down to business. You perform assassinations, do you not? Tigeron leaned forward. Keep your voice down. The walls have ears in places like this. He leaned back again. In point of fact, the din of the tavern room was sufficient concealment, but he wanted to intimidate this confident stranger just a bit. Do you wish to purchase my services? What are the terms? Depending on whom you wish killed, we set a price. The harder the job, the higher the price. I will require the name and payment in full. If we succeed on our first try, fine. If we do not, we will continue until we succeed. You are guaranteed to receive what you pay for. That is our pledge when you enter into the agreement. This one may be more difficult than others. Tigeron shrugged. Nothing is impossible. He signaled the serving girl who had been attending to him since his arrival and placed an order for two tankards of ale. The girl nodded and left at once to fetch the ale. He took note of the fear in her eyes. She knew who he was, that he was paying her well for good services. Credits always trumped fear. The stranger seemed not to notice any of it. He sat back, glancing toward the rattling windows, hearing a fresh change in the wind. A new sound reached to their ears. Rain was falling heavily. The storm had arrived. The last of the mooring lines for the airships docked in the quay would have been lashed in place. The light sheaths would have been brought down and gathered in and the radiant draws pulled in close. Windows and doors of homes and businesses would have been secured. The storm was expected to continue through the night. Rain would be heavy and there would be some flooding. A few of the tavern patrons had risen and were heading for the doors, wrapped in their cloaks and hooded against the downpour, but most stayed put. The storm was an excuse for adding a little more enjoyment to the evening. Another tankard or two, another hour or so. Voices shouted and laughed and chased back the sounds of the storm, brave and alive with confidence. The man you are looking for should be in a village called Emperon, the stranger said. He was at Paranor before, but he has been gone for a while. In any case, I don't want you to act against him right away. Not until after a date I shall set before we leave. Can you wait? As long as you like. But why wait? Paranor. Tigeron was suddenly wary. There were only druids at Paranor. That would be my business. A pause to be sure the point was made. So then, how quickly can we bring the matter to a close? Tigeron leaned forward. I don't know. It would depend on the client and circumstances. You mentioned Paranor. If he is there, it would be much more difficult. Elsewhere, not so much. Usually, we settle matters in no more than one day. You can do it so quickly? Or so skilled as unique. We have special skills, special tools to call upon. A pause. Do you have the use of magic? Magic? Tigeron gave him a look bordering on disgust. Magic is for weaklings and charlatans. Besides, it is outlawed in the territories of the Federation. It is outlawed virtually everywhere but in elven country, and one or two other enclaves still wedded to its uses. 
Just because it is outlawed doesn't mean it isn't employed. The Druids use it as they see fit. And who is going to stop them? Even the Federation seeks to avoid that sort of confrontation. It would take a bold effort indeed to challenge those who inhabit Paranor. You let some sleeping dogs lie. The stranger paused. Besides, aren't assassinations outlawed as well? And are they not employed on a regular basis too? The tankards of ale arrived and the serving girl carefully placed one before each man, accepting the coin the stranger offered as payment before departing. The stranger picked up his drink and took a long pull, swallowing with relish. Wonderful, he pronounced. A fine batch they brew here. Now, I want this done at month's end and not before. As you wish, Tyneron was growing irritated with his whole business. Irritated. And <clears throat> with this unflappable stranger he now regretted agreeing to meet. Tell me, who is it you with that we are to remove from your life? Not yet. I want to hear your price first. Let me say that you will know the victim, and he will not be easily killed. In fact, it will be hard even to get close enough to carry out my wishes. He is trained to protect himself against men like you and yours. I will have time, that I will have the name before you have the price, Tigeron replied, his face dark. You won't take me for a fool? You should know. He has magic at his disposal. Tigeron nodded slowly. That means a higher price, then. Such men can prove troublesome. Cost doesn't matter, only success. Once you take this job, you must complete it. You cannot change your mind later. Tigeron stared at him. The client was being inordinately demanding. Most men who wanted another kill didn't spend time worrying about what it might take to accomplish the job. They only cared about the cost. This stranger had the exact opposite concern, and Tigeron was suddenly troubled in a way that he had not been earlier. What are you not telling me, he asked pointedly, glancing at the men sitting at the other table. Do not even think about calling those men to your defense, Tigeron, that you would be dead before they got out of their seats, if I wished it so. Let us try to stay on point. I desire your services and nothing more. You do not get to ask my name or the details of why I am doing this. You either accept the job or you don't. The choice is yours. Tigeron glowered at him. The name. Being stubborn, digging in. If word got around that he was letting his clients dictate the terms, he would be out of business in a flash. He held the stranger's gaze unmovable. The stranger nodded. Very well. His name is Drisker Ark. Now Tigeron understood the other's concern. A druid of Drisker Ark's skill and reputation would not be easily dispatched, but the amount of money he would demand, he could demand for such an endeavor, could be enormous. He named a ridiculously high figure, so high that if he were the client, he would have walked away. But the stranger just nodded, giving a shrug. Done. Tigeron was suddenly unsettled. He felt oddly trapped, as if the bargain were a snare into which he had stepped. But he was not afraid of risk, so he nodded in turn. You must pay me now. The stranger passed a slip of paper across the table. Take it to any Blue Stone credit agency outlet in Varfleet by tomorrow morning, and it will be honored. The credits will be waiting. Tigeron read the amount written on the paper greedily. If the agency fails to honor it, the stranger continued in his soft, calm voice, you have no obligation to me, and you may keep what I have already given you to meet with me tonight. But the credits will be there. Tigeron sneered. They had better be. The stranger's face showed nothing. Send word to Paranor when the matter is concluded. I will be there. Make sure your message reveals nothing about yourself. Make it a general announcement intended for all. He rose from the table, tightening his cloak about his shoulders and pulled his hood forward over his head so his face was hidden once more. Do not fail me, he whispered. Then he walked to the doors of the tavern and went out into the stormy night. There, you can skip that chapter. <laughs> So, as you might imagine, if you've read my work, things are not going to go well for Tigeron. <laughs> <laughs> and Driscark will prove to be a difficult person to deal with. Well, now what will we do? Um, announcements, right? 
let's see, what can I tell you? Uh, this is my sole appearance, uh, other than I will be in Cannon Beach, uh, Oregon, at the bookstore there on the 24th of this, of this month. Uh, but I'm not doing anything else. Um, yeah, so, um, this button I'm wearing, um, I'm going to say something about this. My daughter died, and um, that's why I'm not doing anything this year. Uh, it was very unexpected, and it's put quite a, uh, left quite a gap in our family relationship, and it's been very hard on both my wife and myself to even think about it. Uh, we had a celebration of life for her yesterday, which I'm happy to say a lot of people came to. So, uh, as a result, uh, I've cut back on everything. Won't be touring, won't be doing uh, any of the Comic Cons or anything else, uh, for that matter, that relates to here I am, look at me, aren't I wonderful? Um, I'll just be uh, doing this one, one thing because somehow I, I never seem to be able to get out of doing this one. <laughs> Life at New Books goes on. Um, it does make you think a little bit about where you are in your world and, and what you do with yourself, and um, I'm sure I can make use of it in, in some way um, at some later date. But right now, I'm still processing, as I say. Uh, and for me, it's uh, easier than it is for some of the other members of my family who spend a lot of time with Lisa, and uh, uh, I think will feel the, the loss even, even more than I do. Um, so anyway, uh, I am... Uh, not involved with the TV show uh, this year. Uh, I, ha I was earlier, but then, you know, after this happened, I dropped out. So I can't tell you very much, in case you want to know anything. But the only thing I can tell you is that it will be uh, on end of September, beginning of October, somewhere right around you there. It's on Spike. We've moved it. Uh, MTV is history. Um, and... Uh, they did the job for a while, but the show this year is, people were, were asking me when I was doing the Skype today, and the show this year is much darker. Much darker. Put the kids to bed. Uh, it does not follow one of my books, uh, but it does draw on characters and themes and plot lines from both Sword and Wish Song. Keep in mind, as you look at it, that this is 20 years before Wish Song. So everybody's younger. Everybody's greener, and the behavior has to reflect this. And the writers did this very purposefully. So uh, I keep saying, you know, it's not the same. Well, it really isn't the same, so just, just remember that. But uh, I think you'll enjoy what you see, and I think you'll enjoy what they've done with the characters. There's a lot of backstory that they wrote about uh, Will and Shea Elmsford that never existed before. I think that's great. They've come up with some very imaginative ideas about how their relationship might have gone, and uh, further developing Will's phobia, as it were, about magic, and the struggle to try to find a way to come to terms with the fact that he's inherited the use of uh, the elf stones. Uh, let's see, that's about it. I've seen some of the cuts, and uh, not all of them yet. Uh, I haven't had really had time to uh, do a lot of looking at it, so I don't know. But what I've seen, visually beautiful, just like last season. Um, and, you know, those actors who survived last season are back. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> once again, don't get too fond of anybody, uh, as far as I can tell, so far anyway. Um, this book uh, series, uh, Black Elf Stone, uh, The Fall of Shannara, is a four book series. It will publish regularly every June until it's finished, um, as far as I can tell anyway. I have uh, finished the second book already and uh, we'll do editing work this, this, this month and next month and start the third book in, in the late summer. So, um, you know, I don't see any reason why I shouldn't get done. I'm working a year ahead of time right now with that. Uh, shouldn't disappoint too many people. No George Martin here. Uh, <laughs> so. Well, I was gratuitous, wasn't it? <laughs> and on video. Uh, and on video. I'm sure I'll get a call tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> so at any rate, um, other than that, uh, I'm doing those uh, special editions of Sword, Elfstones, and Wish Song, which you've probably heard about by now, uh, published through Sean 
special editions with a whole, all new illustrations. Uh, if you're interested, there's still some left, uh, but uh, there, most of them are gone. Um, and uh, so you can sign into the sign page or contact Sean through the website or whatever if you want to pursue this uh, for any reason or if you've got too much money and you want to get rid of it. Uh, I'll, I'm sure I'll get a lot of them to sign. Nick. Oh, I've signed them all, haven't I? For the first time. Well, I don't have to worry then. Forget it. <laughs> no personalizations will be allowed. Uh, <laughs> so, um, let's see. That's about it for me until next year. Uh, I don't have too much more going on. I've talked about TV show. I can't think of anything else right now. That's about it. So, as usual, if you have a question you want to ask, um, I will answer it. I'm not going to keep you here very much longer because I know that this is a big crowd and I don't want you to have to be here until midnight or something. Yes, yes, ma'am. You know, they, you people won't let me alone. <laughs> I got, that's the question I think I got the most of today on, on the, on the uh, Facebook. It was, ah, you know, what about Landover? What's wrong with you? Um, well, so uh, the answer is I haven't forgotten. Uh, I realize I set up the prospect of a sequel to Princess of Landover. I'm aware I haven't written it. Uh, I have thought about it. Um, and my plan now, well now it's practically a pledge, is that once I finish the four books set here, which means I've got to write two more, but assuming I write the, the next two this year and next year, um, I will start on the, on the last land or book. I find I can no longer wait for them to make the movie. You know, that was my plan. It was a good plan. But, you know, the stupid movie people won't cooperate with this plan. It was, a, you know, it was all set. I was going to wait late. They said, yes, the movie is green-lighted. It'll film here. I would write the book. I would have it ride the crest of the movie into stardom. Well, forget that, you know. <laughs> just, the uh, the uh, uh, head of uh, Warner Brothers, since fired, I'd like to point out, uh, decided in his wisdom that uh, after they had come to him with the star, the script, all the component pieces, that he wasn't interested in anymore. So I, I got his address. At <laughs> any rate, uh, so, you know, but luckily uh, everybody said, well, uh, then he got fired, so they said, well, you know, so they let the option drop, drop in the meantime, but uh, everybody is still on board with doing this thing. We just have to find a new studio, so that's what they're in the process of doing now. You know, hope springs eternal, right? But I don't know. I don't think I'm going to live to see the end of this one. Um, so <laughs> that's it. The only other thing is uh, I, am, uh, I have been working on another book for a long time uh, called Street Freaks, and uh, that will uh, publish sometime uh, probably the first part of next year, you think, something like that. Uh, Sean is going to do it. It is not, I repeat, not a fantasy, nor is it attached in any way to anything else I've done. It's all by itself out there, a lonely creature. Um, and Sean's going to publish it uh, under Grim Oak Press, and I'm going to, you know, do the usual stuff in regard to supporting it, and it will be available uh, with any luck everywhere. Uh, but that is the next big thing I'm going to do uh, that I haven't done yet. And then we'll just see what the uh, response is to it, because this is kind of the, where I, you know, I'm kind of at the age now where I'm ready to experiment with some things and just see what, what happens. Um, this is a futuristic story. It is uh, got elements of science fiction. And it's got elements of fantasy. Um, but it's different than what you're used to seeing. So, you know, there's no elves, no dwarves, uh, no magic in the traditional sense anyway. Uh, but I've read, I've read it a couple times uh, from the first chapter, and people seem to like it pretty well, so I figured, what the heck? And I wrote it, so I'm going to put it out there. Yeah. So anyway, there'll be more about that on the website as time goes on. Um, yes, sir? Any advice for anybody wanting to I can't hear you. Any advice for anybody that's wanting to pick up a pen and write? Who wants to pick up what? <laughs> oh, who wants to write? No. <laughs> well, I don't know. You know, that's one, that's a loaded question, as they say, because there's uh, I have all kinds of advice, but you know, we have to go home tonight. Um, I suppose the 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 answer is is first of all, you have to write, and you know, I tell everybody the same thing. If you want to be a writer, you got to write. That's the first requirement. You got to write every day, and you should write at the same time, and you should be left alone, and there should be no interruptions ever. 
You just have to do it. And you have to do it again and again and again and again and so on and so forth for maybe a couple of years. I don't know, however long it takes to get it done. And you have to be patient with yourself. You know, you, you, have, to, you have to be patient because this is a slow moving process, especially in the beginning. Um, I think you have to read books. You have to read a lot of books. You gotta turn off the television, leave it off. You have to immerse yourself in the culture of being a writer. Uh, I think that any help you can get from going to writers conferences uh, by talking to editors and listening to what all the other authors have to say about the craft would be very helpful. Um, I think all those things are, are very important. Uh, read my book, read my book, read my book. Sometimes the magic works, maybe, who knows. Uh, or read a Stephen King book. You, you should read Stephen King's book on writing, it's very good. Uh, it's totally opposite from what I believe, but you know, we all have, but no, you need the other, you know, nobody does it the same way. That's why it's important to do that. Everybody has a different approach in this business. There is no one path to get, to get yourself into this game. Then you've got to be lucky. You're welcome. How can I miss you? <laughs> Uh, I grew up in Sterling and hung out at Mississippi a lot, and I think you grew up there at that time there. How did Mississippi influence your writing or your thoughts? Really? What? Uh, you still live there? Uh, he no. grew up where I grew up. So we tried to move back from here. We made it three years and then come back. Too expensive, <laughs> wasn't it? What? Too expensive. <laughs> Children, they rule your lives. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I mean, I, um, I, place influences your writing, I think. That's why I travel uh, a lot, is because when I'm in a place uh, and Judine is taking the pictures and I'm writing the notes and so on, and we're thinking about, always thinking about what might happen here, that kind of thing. So uh, I, I was, I left uh, Illinois in 86, but I wrote Running with the Demon in something like 97. So I was gone 10 years before I wrote that book but I remembered that park. Yeah. And I remembered going down into the darker parts of the underground and down to where, you know, everything. And I remember the burial mounds and all that comes back to serve your purposes in this world. Um, and that's, I could point to some, uh, practically every book and show you somewhere in there where a place I went or traveled with uh, impacted the work in some measurable way. So I just, you know, it's easier than just thinking of it all up in your head. You just say, oh yeah, it's gonna be here, I'm gonna do that. We're always looking for easier ways to get this job done, right? Yes? So why was Fairhorn the TV show like in the desert instead of the forest? Why was, <laughs> yes, why, one would ask. The question was, why was Paranor in, well, where was it again? It was in the desert, like they opened up. Oh yeah, right, 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 yeah. Near the ocean. Um, yeah, well, just seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> you know, this is the TV show. They decided what they wanted to do. Um, you know, they were the ones who conceived of the idea of the race at the beginning. Now, do I think that was stupid? No. I actually thought it was very cool. I liked it a lot. And I, it's, it's because when you read a book, it was written in 1977, they all opened sort of the same way. The hills were beautiful with the sunset and on and on and they walked and they saw the birds and them. But we don't do that anymore because people want a quicker in to what's going on, particularly on television and in the movies. Something has to happen right now. You know. If it isn't a small, you know, what I call senior cinema, which is what I like, uh, or some kind of, you know, tranquil type show, they all start with a bang of some sort, particularly if it's an action show. So I, I think they decided that that was why it was the race, but I'm skipping over your question. Uh, I, I, I don't know, I mean, why did they make Paranor look like it was a, a city of the future? Because it was cool. <laughs> you know, this, there doesn't have to be any reason, and, and I, I, I say the same thing. If you want to understand how books and uh, movies or TV shows exist, coexist peacefully. It's this. The books are the books. The TV show is the TV show. They do not have to be the same. In fact, sometimes it's best if they aren't. And what happens is you have two different experiences. And that's certainly true with Elfstones, which is a 
not an entirely different story, but very different in many ways, over here, and Elfstones, which is happy, happily over here, like that. Is that clear? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to compete with a TV show. You know, I don't. I don't want people coming up and saying, "Didn't didn't didn't you write a book about this?" I, I see the TV show so good. Get away from me. <laughs> I, I when I was traveling around, I remember after they did Lord of the Rings, I had these kids come up and they'd say, "Oh my gosh, I saw the Lord of the Rings, and your books are like the Lord of the Rings." And I said, "Yeah, well, I know, and they're they're books too. There are." <laughs> Please don't let that happen. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> okay. A couple more questions. Anybody have a qu Anybody who hasn't gotten their question answered need to get it? No. Ah, easy, easy audience here. Not you. <laughs> okay, Mary. What? <laughs> As you're ending a series and looking back in the process, do you end the series as you begin it, and does it end kind of like how you think of it in the beginning when it's ending, or does it have some surprises along the way to you? Well, it's been uh, almost 40 years, so yeah, there's a few surprises, I'll tell you that for sure. Uh, even ending it is a surprise. <laughs> At 26, they got 30 books, uh, yeah, there's a surprise. Um, I, I think um, in, in the main, uh, most of it worked its way, you know, step by step by step, the way that the journeys do like that. And you have a, you know, down there is the place you're going to, but getting there is all over the place. Um, and I, I knew uh, what the ending, the, the ending, was going to be for many, many years. This is, this is a, where's my writer guy? Listen carefully. I knew what the ending was going to be. I knew the last scene, I knew the last sentence, and I had it firmly in mind, right? So, I put that aside and forgot about it for many, many, many years, and I've been, now here I am, you know, thinking it needs to get done and so forth. So I finished the first book, and I finished the second book, and all of a sudden I thought, that ending isn't right. <laughs> I know. And I thought, well, damn, what is the ending? <laughs> and it's still, and, and the ending is, the old ending is still in there, but I thought it needs a further uh, segue in order to be complete. Uh, I may change my mind again, you know how it is, but I just, I just think that's what you have to remember when you're creating something like this, is that you always have to be open to the possibility possibility of change and even when you think you know what it ought to be you have to remember that maybe it's not going to end up that way so, I don't know yes ma'am so thinking about endings what's the biggest emotion that you're feeling right now what's the main emotion that you feel about ending this series what is the major emotion I feel about ending this series well I'm really tempted to say relief <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's, I'm not sad about ending it, uh, and maybe it's because I'm cheating, uh, and I'm not actually ending it. I'm just ending the end, right? Uh, then I can go back, and I can finish the prehistory, and I can write other stuff, that, you know, short, long, whatever, at places that I feel uh, I need to add things in. So uh, it's not like saying goodbye. There's a, there's a certain, there's a, there's a combination, there's a certain satisfaction with having gotten this far, uh, and got and and had the success that I've had with this series, which believe me, you better not take for granted. Um, and, but the other part is, um, I feel like uh, um, I feel like uh, I forgot what I felt like. Okay. <laughs> something. Just <laughs> it was there for a moment, then it went away. Uh, it'll come later. I, I guess I guess the main thing is is that I feel an obligation to the readers, not at this late state to stage to disappoint them with something that's a half-baked ending. Because I hate writers that do that. They are despicable in my eyes. <laughs> you know, you always have to have a good ending to your book or you failed. You have failed no matter how good the first three quarters are. Uh, and so I try very, very hard to make the endings live up to the expectations of the readers. And this one particularly because it's really the ending of 20 some 30 books I said yeah it's 30 books so that that has to be uh, that has to be really good it has to and I and, and this this series is all about to some extent an homage to all the readers I've had all these years 
And I want them to look, when they, when they read this book, uh, and, they, and they, they see who's in it, and they begin to re read about what the plot is, they're going to say, I remember, you know, back there. That was there. I remember that. And, oh, I, got there. I never thought they'd, uh, you know, have that person come back. Or I want that kind of response so that there are, are surprises all the way through. So if I get that job done, then I get a, I get a gold star. <laughs> yeah, you're the kid that uh, caused your parents to move from Sterling. What'd you do anyway? No, actually, they aren't my parents, for one. Oh, well, that's a problem. <laughs> uh, I to be with me. Okay. Um, my question is, aren't you going to just try to make any ten books, get a bit more of that moolah, just copy the story again? Do, do I sometimes copy the story? No. I know, but I'm old. Bear with me. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I said, are you just going to try to make ten books? Let's copy the story again, get a bit more moolah? No, you know, uh, <laughs> you, you know what? You have, been, you have been going to too many Marvel comic movies. <laughs> actually, actually, I'll tell you what I've been doing for years, and nobody's caught me yet, but I'm going to admit it. If you go back and look at those books, you'll discover they all have different colors, covers, but they're the same book. <laughs> I just, I just moved the chapters around to keep people guessing. <laughs> Change the names, nobody notices. Oh, wait a minute, maybe that's James Patterson. Oh. I, I'm going to be in such trouble. <laughs> that's, I don't mean that, that's not true. That's not true at all. I'm just being snarky. <laughs> I, I, I can see where you would say that this would be a good idea, and I'm all in favor of making money. But the truth is, is that uh, the people that are sitting out here, they may not look that bright, but they are. <laughs> and, and they can tell you when you are fudging, <laughs> and when you're shortchanging them, and when you're writing something that's only a half-baked effort. I know they can. They were quick to tell me if I'm not you know, sticking to those. I, I think you deserve that t-shirt. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the question. I appreciate it. No problem. All right. Okay. Yes, sir. Which character did you hate to lose? Oh, I never hate to lose any of them. You know, they come and they go. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 it's like saying, well, would you, if you could bring somebody back to life, would you? And the answer is no, I wouldn't. Uh, I don't kill people off willy-nilly, even though it might seem like it now and again. They die because they put themselves in the line of fire, as it were, um, and uh, because they're, they are at high risk or it's, you know, there's a reason, always a reason for it. And it always has to do with the advancement of the story. So, I don't know, who would I, who would I, re well, you know, I mean, uh, now, in hindsight, I'd probably find a way to bring Alan on back. Thank you. you know. <laughs> Obviously, he was a tremendously popular character. Uh, so that's a little bit about Drisker Ark. If you think about Alan on, you're seeing Drisker Ark in the new book. He is like that, only there's a different personality trait, as you'll see. Okay, all right, that's probably good enough, isn't it? Yes? Okay. Um, so, uh, I guess we're going to go ahead and sign books. Um, so everyone can stay seated. I will... Uh, bring him over to the table to get grace. I will, I will stay to the bitter end. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have something you need signed, I'll be here to sign it. Thank you. Thank you.